Okay, this can be tricky, so it's important that you listen to this video and watch how it works before you go through this Storify and uh, read the articles. Now, campaign finance reform goes all the way back to the Watergate scandal in the 1970s when Nixon was caught using taxpayer funds to break into the other party's headquarters, the Democrat Party headquarters, to steal their election strategy. This whole scandal gave light to all sorts of shady um, donations and Nixon effectively um, had to resign. Following that we get the first bits of legislation, the first attempts at campaign finance reform. Um, if you go to this article you'll see here there's a little overview of the past reforms. Okay, the key one that we need to know is the 1974 and 1976 Federal Election Campaign Act. Okay, and the main things that this did, as you can see here, 1976 is the key year. This is the main impact, okay? Basically, read this but in, read this and make notes, but in basic, if you're an individual American citizen, you can donate $1,000 to a candidate. If you're a company, you can donate, but you have to form a political action committee, and then that political action committee can donate £5,000, provided that that £5,000 comes from at least five different people within the company all donating their maximum amount. So you can see there that it tries to make sure that candidates are getting money from lots of different people rather than getting millions from one person. The criticism of that is obviously that the president's going to pass legislation because he's in the pocket of the person that gave him all the money to win his election campaign. So these uh, restrictions were aimed at reducing the reliance on big donors. They were aimed at making the system transparent because all donations would be tracked. And they are also an attempt to um, reduce the overall cost of the election itself. And this was done by offering a system of, called, of what was called matching funds. So after the primary season, the federal government would match the amount of money that you raised so you wouldn't have to worry about raising any more. And that was a hope that would, would even out the playing field. Okay. So that's the main aim of the 1976 legislation, or the, sorry, the 1974 legislation. Now, as always, as you've talked about with Mr. Floyd, when money wants to get into the election, it always finds a way. And sure enough, in 1976, Supreme Court struck down certain parts of this in Buckley versus Vallejo. So from the text, a restriction on the amount of money a person or group can spend on political communication during a campaign necessarily reduces the quantity of expression by restricting the number of issues discussed, the depth of their exploration and the size of the audience reach. This is because virtually every means of communicating ideas in today's mass society requires the expenditure of money. As you can see there, it's the First Amendment. The Supreme Court are defending the First Amendment here and effectively the decision meant that your own money is not subject to the, to the regulations. So if you're a rich candidate, you can spill, still spend as much money on your own campaign as you like. So they're the historical reforms or attempts at reform. Now. As we always know, groups found a way around this, okay? So, um, and, and then John McCain, senator who ran for the presidency in 2000 against George W. Bush for the, for the Republican primary, he actually lost that because Bush outspent him significantly. So this became a pet project for McCain, and he teamed up with a, a Democrat called Russ Feingold to pass the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, or the McCain-Feingold Law. This was aimed at beefing up FECA 1976 because what basically groups had start to do, started to do was engage in soft money spending. As you can see here, the bill banned soft money. Okay? Soft money was when 
um, groups, groups or companies would, would spend their money advertising and they would not directly name any candidates, they would not directly attack or support any candidates, but the ad would clearly support one of the two sides. And so it was kind of a way around the LEC regulations because the, um, you, you couldn't give unlimited amounts to a candidate, but you could just run your own advert that doesn't directly mention the candidate. So this kind of soft money um, for, for party building activities was effectively banned. Now, other things that the BCRA did. Just have a look here at the major rules just to get a basic idea, pause it and make some notes. And then we're going to have a look at the limits imposed. So BCRA basically bans soft money. Crucially, corporations, labour unions, national banks and federally chartered corporations are prohibited from contributing. And what it does, it, it increases the amount that an individual can give to 2000 to try and encourage individuals to give money straight to campaigns but it bans soft money altogether this money given straight to a campaign that's hard money okay soft money banned okay also you there was a blackout a blackout period so there was no advertising allowed within 30 days of a primary and within 60 days of an election so as you can see here we have a, a, a revamped set of limits and vitally these here we call aggregate limits so if you want to give 2000 to a candidate and 25000 to a committee and then you want to do this as well you could again get around the rules by giving 2000 for example to 20 different candidates and then you would exceed this number so the aggregate limits are there to stop a very rich person influencing too many races so this is, this is quite far-reaching, okay? Just understand what a PAC is, because you will, you're going to hear the term super PAC. Super PACs only came into existence after 2010. A PAC is the official name for the type of group that is allowed to donate to candidates. So read this to make sure you understand what a PAC is. Okay. So we've got a basic idea of the, of the structure of law that stops money getting into elections. Now we can look at how the history of campaign finance reform has been a uh, history of slow erosion of the rules. Because as we'll see, the quite strict rules set down by FECA and BCRA have been quite heavily destroyed. So, soft money's banned, meet 527 groups. Now, don't get misled by 527. That's just the section of the tax code that they're formed underneath. And, vi and vitally, they are issue advocacy groups. Okay? So they don't explicitly, they don't explicitly elect or defeat a particular candidate. Okay? They engage in raising awareness of an issue. And so you can see here, Swift Boat Veterans for Truth, which ran issue ads critical of Democrat presidential nominee John Kerry's Vietnam War record, is one of the more well-known 527s. Now, vitally, guys, 527s tend to be um, pre-2010, okay? Now, it's not as if the receipts have gone down. These, these things are still um, quite prominent. But you'll notice that the federal, low, the federal amount has decreased significantly since 2010. Okay? So these 527 groups are basically just exploiting a loophole in the rules. But actually, this is an older example because it's a pre-2010 one. So while 527 is a, a, a pretty good bit of knowledge to throw in why um, campaign finance reform has failed, it's actually not as good as the more recent incarnation of these, what things that are called 501c4 social welfare nonprofits. 
So 527 is just an example of the way that it's, it's possible to find loopholes in attack code to get around the regulations. But, but keep in mind that 527 spending on, on the federal level has halved since 2004. Okay? So here's the aims. As we stand, there's the elections. Okay? But we need to consider the impact of Supreme Court decisions. Buckley and Vallejo, we've already talked about, but this is the vital case. Now, I suggest you click on this and read it in full, but I'm going to summarise. The Citizens United case, which is interrupted by a phone call, so we were on Citizens United. Um, the Citizens United case is, uh, as Mr Floyd was saying, one of the crucial uh, nails in the coffin of campaign finance reform. And it's mainly because the court changed uh, its composition in 2005 with the replacement of uh, Justice O'Connor with Samuel Alito. And with Kennedy swinging right on campaign finance reform, basically what Citizens United did is it said that a, a, a corporation or labour union spending its own money on its own expression of political speech, i.e. doing an independent advert, is an expression of the First Amendment and to ban that is, is effectively infringing the First Amendment. So that part of McCain-Feingold was struck down by the Supreme Court in a controversial 5-4 decision. Okay, So effectively now, if you're a rich corporation and you want to create an advert to support or attack a candidate, you can do it freely as long as it's not linked, as long as it's independent. We call these super PACs. A ruling that goes with that is the fact that to blanket blackout advertising within 30 days of a primary and 60 days of election would also be an unacceptable infringement of the First Amendment. And so again, the floodgates are open. You can advertise right up to election day. Can you see that actually the McCain-Feingold laws are having its, are effectively having their guts ripped out by this, by this decision? And the decision that goes with it, which is speechnow.org versus FEC, means that rich individuals are not limited in the amount of money that they can give to a super PAC. So a good example of this is Sheldon Adelson in 2012, in the 2012 presidential election. He gave over $50 million of his own money to a super PAC called Restore Our Future. And that just shows that the, the, the money, the floodgates are open. And it, it's, it's spending season in, in, in American elections. So the final nail is, in, is this case McCutcheon. McCutcheon versus FEC. And basically in McCutcheon... The case of aggregate donor, effectively what's happened, if you watch this video in your own time, that'll be good. Sean McCutcheon basically wanted to give the maximum, the maximum amount to as many candidates as he, want, he wants. He thinks it's a violation of the First Amendment to have an aggregate limit. Put, put briefly, there's your aggregate limits. The Supreme Court agreed with him. So there are now no aggregate limits. You can give to as many candidates as you like. So if you add Buckley and Vallejo to Citizens United, to Speech Now, to McCutcheon, you can see that the Supreme Court has effectively gutted super, uh, campaign finance regulations for good. And then you have super PACs because of it. Have a look at this video. Okay. Second point is loopholes. We've already talked about 527 groups, but the latest incarnation of them are the so-called dark money groups. They're founded under Section 501c4 of the tax code, okay, and they're social welfare organisations, and because of that, they don't need to disclose their donors. Now, the reason why this is controversial, just pause and read, is because most super PACs actually have a 501c4 that's affiliated. So, for example, American Crossroads, which is a, which is a super PAC led by Karl Rove, 
They have a 501c4 called Crossroads GPS. Now, if Sheldon, Sheldon Adelson or a, another rich donor wants to give to a super PAC, that money is going to be tracked. But if he gives it to a 501c4, then it's not tracked. The 501c4 can then donate it to the super PAC. And so it acts as...